Hello, I'm going to present a talk on physics-informed AI for imagery construction in PET. Um, during the recording, um, the webcam wasn't available because I was on a Zoom call, um, but I hope nonetheless you'll be able to enjoy the talk with just voiceover and slides. Thanks very much. So, as mentioned, um, I'll be presenting um, physics-informed AI for imagery construction in PET. And I'm hoping really to, to review uh, basically this area of using artificial intelligence in positron emission tomography and uh, try and keep you, uh, get you up to date with where we are now going in the field. So as we know, positron emission tomography um, is used to image the brain, um, the heart and the body, for example, to look at dementia or heart disease or cancer, often using fluorinating labeled compounds such as fluorodeoxyglucose. So this uh, radio tracer is injected into the bloodstream of the patient under study and the fluorine 18 um, decays to oxygen 18 with emission of a positron, hence positron emission tomography. And then we get the well-known positron electron annihilation, um, giving rise to back-to-back -back high energy photon pairs just by conversion of mass to energy or the mass of the positron and electron. Um, so these high-energy um, annihilation photons are detected by uh, a high-density array of crystals in a PET scanner. And of course, these days, um, we're now looking at the arrival of total body PET, where this array of crystals extends over two meters over the body. But for the moment, we're still uh, with conventional PET, and that's what I'll be focusing on in this talk. So as we can see here, we get these back-to-back -back photon pairs being detected by the scanner. And we could be dealing with hundreds of millions to up to a billion of such photon pairs being detected in a typical PET scan. So um, the focus of this talk will be considering the radio tracer distribution, such as uh, this, where we're looking at a slice through the patient here. But of course, in general, this would be a 3D or a four-dimensional distribution of a radioactivity uh, within the patient under study. And I'll be calling that a function f of r. And this, of course, is inside uh, the PET scanner. This is, in fact, a, a simultaneous PET MR scanner that I'm showing here, which I'll be modeling with uh, a linear model, a matrix A. So that's the PET scanner. And this results in a measured data vector M. That's typically about 1,000 um, sinograms, which are basically collections of projections around the head of the subject um, at, at various copolar as well as azimuthal angles. And what we're doing in imagery construction is seeking to represent that continuous radio tracer distribution, F of R, represent it using uh, obviously a discrete approximation of that distribution, and I'm gonna call that a vector X, just a list of numbers corresponding to the radioactive concentration in each and every pixel, ideally in three dimensions, if not four dimensions. So conventionally in PET, if you'll allow me now to change to this simple Shep-Logan phantom simulation, we have some ground truth, which I'll label as T. So this is like a discrete representation of what we actually would like to reconstruct. Um, and we have that inside the scanner field of view. We detect these back-to-back -back photon pairs, which give rise in this 2D simulated example to a, to a collected sinogram, a data vector M. That's the measured data in the PET scanner. And what we're trying to do in image reconstruction is to estimate what that ground truth was, what that radio tracer distribution was. I'll be calling that X, as mentioned. And I'm going to call that a current estimate because, as we'll see, this would be an iterative process. So this is where we can apply our physics models with conventional PET reconstruction, where we model this scanner with a whole cascade of linear operators, for example, to model uh, positron range, as well as here the geometric component, which is often modeled by the radon transform. So I'm just denoting that by this uh, collection of line integrals around that radio tracer distribution, which gives rise to a sinogram. This is like a model of the mean data. So here we have some estimate of our reconstruction. We forward model it using a matrix A, of which the core part is the radon transform. So that's just a forward projection. And then uh, we add on other models such as Compton scatter, for example. And so that's why I've got Compton here to show that we're dealing with not only a mathematical model, but also a physics model. Um, and then we use the well-known Poisson distribution, hence Simeon Denis Poisson there, uh, where we just compare our current model of the mean data with the uh, noisy distribution, which is assumed to follow Poisson statistics due to the limited number of counts. And so we're going to use a distance measure between the forward projected, the prediction of the data, 
um, that's the system matrix A applied to my current reconstructed estimate X. I'm going to compare that with the measured data vector M, and I'm going to call that a distance D, which uh, for PET imaging um, is normally nearly always given by the negative Poisson log likelihood. So in other words, the maximum Poisson likelihood, but treating it as a distance, so therefore we deal, deal with the negative of it. And then we're going to use an iterative reconstruction algorithm to find the uh, representation X, which when forward modeled with that linear model A, will best correspond to the measured data vector M. And so we, we're going to use an algorithm to optimize this objective function, find the X that minimizes that distance. And because we're using a Poisson distribution and not, say, a Gaussian distribution, if it was Gaussian, this would be a least squares problem. But with Poisson, uh, we don't have a closed form solution. So therefore, we have to use an iterative method in positron emission tomography. And I'll be going into this al well-known algorithm later on, so I won't dwell on it now, other than to call it maximum likelihood expectation maximization or ordered subsets expectation maximization. So this is like a, a basic overview of, of what is behind um, image reconstruction in PET. Now, there are issues that arise with this conventional framework. So, for example, um, this vector X is being fitted, in general, to noisy data M. Secondly, to try and compensate for that with conventional techniques, we would use regularization strategies, such as MAP-EM. So instead of maximum likelihood, we'd be dealing with maximum a posteriori, where we build in prior information about what we believe this radio tracer distribution would look like. And conventionally, this is often very mathematically convenient and a very simple uh, prior probability or otherwise known as a penalty function and um, that, that is a problem because we don't know what kind of prior to use and often it is way too simplified. Furthermore we don't know how strongly to enforce this prior information about what that, that radio tracer distribution should, should look like. But anyway just to notice up here that what it's doing is penalizing overfitting. So in other words if this x overfits to the data vector m then we penalize um, over, overfitting. In other words, if this is too noisy, we penalize it using this regularization prior. So hopefully you're relatively familiar with these concepts. A very conventional kind of prior used in inverse problems would be something like a quadratic, where what we do is just look at the L2 norm of all the pixel values, and uh, that would be attributed to, to Tikhonov, for example, hence showing a, 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 an old photo of that famous uh, regularization strategy for inverse problems. So um, to give you some concrete examples of real data reconstruction, um, prior even to what I've just shown, we would have done methods such as filtered back projection that had been in the 1980s to 1990s. So this would involve um, a three-dimensional, um, rather a filtering of two-dimensional parallel projections, which are then back projected. And this would follow a Gaussian noise model and that's why we get quite noisy uh, data in the background here. This is actually for fluorinating flumazenil imaging for looking at GABA receptors in the brain. So if we upgrade that to the iterative procedure that I just mentioned in the slides before, we could change from this Gaussian model that's implicit in filtered back projection and change it to a Poisson noise model, such as the iterative scheme I've just briefly outlined and we'll be going into in more detail later. And that, as we can see here, this iterative reconstruction, ordered subsets EM or maximum likelihood EM, um, notably reduces noise, especially in low activity uh, regions. So furthermore, we can not only improve the, the noise model, um, but we can also improve the model of the physics. And so in PET imaging, quite a successful technique was to build in modeling of the positron range or the point spread function, as it's commonly referred to, and you can see here that we can improve the spatial resolution of the images if we model that finite resolution effect. So that's taking us up to about year 2000 thereabouts. Um, more recent progress has involved uh, more involved regularization strategies. So here I'm showing the fact that even though we've got nice images at this point, this was for a high resolution research tomograph uh, PET scanner. Here I'm showing images um, for, I think it's uh, Flubetaben. Um, so this is uh, using a simultaneous PET-MR scanner. Um, and also what I'm showing here is that we, we often want to look at smaller, uh, shorter scan, scan times or indeed reduced radiation dose. So here I've got very low count data reconstructed with conventional MLEM. And then to compensate for the very limited counts, we would use a regularization strategy 
such as some kind of quadratic penalty between neighboring pixel pairs to avoid um, overfitting to the noise in the data. And you can see that smooths the images. But then what we've also been doing over recent years is to introduce, for example, a T1 weighted MR image to provide guidance of that regularization smoothing process to result, for example, in images like the one I'm showing here. This is using a so-called Bauscher prior, where all we do is look at similarity of values in the MR image and expect similarity of the values within the PET image. In other words, we don't smooth across boundaries that are present in the MR. So again, to highlight issues with these conventional methods. First of all, if we stick with the methods on the left-hand side there, the problem there is that we'd be fitting the reconstructed image X to noisy data M. Then, of course, if we choose to regularize using, for example, maximum a posteriori EM or indeed with MR guidance, the problem is even then, what is the prior that we should be using and how strong should it be? Furthermore, if we build in MR information, just how much of that MR guidance should we be using? So those are remaining issues with classical or even state-of-the-art methods that do not yet use AI. Um, furthermore, as uh, briefly alluded to earlier, we're wanting to reduce the radiation dose to the patient. So typically that's about 10 millisieverts, perhaps from 370 megabecquerels of activity injected into the patient. So we want to reduce that, uh, particularly if we're dealing with healthy subjects or if we've got memory clinic patients, we, we just want to reduce that dose as much as possible. And also we're looking to wanting to reduce the acquisition time. And of course, if we do that, then noise is even more of an issue, and therefore these aforementioned problems are even more pertinent as we go to a lower uh, injected dose and a shorter scan time. Hence the question, as you can tell where I'm going, can we do better? And it does indeed seem like that by using artificial intelligence or machine learning or deep learning, we can indeed do better. So what is it behind machine learning that, that is the difference to these conventional reconstruction methods? Well, as you probably know, at the core of machine learning is this uh, use of training um, set data. Well, what we do is have a huge database, I'm only showing three here, but maybe hundreds of thousands of example radio tracer distributions. So I'm putting those along this kind of X axis here. These are, these are the high quality or ground truth reference images for which we are assuming we have knowledge of noisy measured data. So this could be found by simulation or indeed it could be found by, for example, having very high count scans um, and then using this to, to infer the mapping for when we have low count data. So by whatever means, whether simulation or high count acquisitions, we can have a high quality reference and corresponding measured data. Now with machine learning, we can do supervised learning. In other words, we're providing the correct answers that we expect for the, the known measurements on the, the y-axis here. And we can learn, for example, in this simple example here, a linear mapping that will take us from measured data sets to infer the underlying high quality ground truth radio tracer distribution. So here I'm showing this mapping as some function f, which operates on a measured data vector m and is parameterized by some vector theta. Um, and we want that mapping to deliver the ground truth or high quality reference. And so we're going to find that uh, mapping by basically considering up to i equals 1 to capital N um, training set examples. In other words, how many? Here I've only got three, but often, as I say, it'd be many more than that. And the methods I'll be presenting towards the end of this session will be dealing with maybe about 30 such examples, but with direct methods, as we'll see, maybe 200,000 examples. And we're going to minimize the distance between. Um, this uh, learned mapping, this linear mapping in this case, although it will, as we'll see, be non-linear, um, we want to learn the, the, we want to minimize the distance between that mapping and the actual ground truth. So the mapping of the measured data to the ground truth, such that when we found that best mapping from measurement to high quality reference at test time or inference time, when we have a new uh, measured data set M, we can plug that into this mapping and predict what the ground truth high quality reference would have been. So the key point here compared to conventional methods is that we are using knowledge of a high quality reference or a ground truth and all of those previous conventional methods, even up to state of the art map methods, did nev never made use of that high quality reference. So this is where we really gain a lot in machine learning. So let's take a look at that linear mapping. 
um, just to see what could be done with it. So here I'm showing a simple uh, 2D simulation and I'm imagining that we want to find some system matrix, uh, some inverse mapping F, which can operate on that list of uh, values in the measured sinogram to deliver an estimate of the ground truth radio tracer distribution. So first of all, is, is a linear mapping even going to be feasible? Well, we know, um, I showed, for example, filtered back projection results earlier. That is an example of a linear mapping. Uh, where we just cascade linear mappings. We would take, for example, the measured data, we would Fourier transform it, so linear mapping, take a ramp filter or a Kolsch filter, and then do an inverse Fourier transform, and then back project the data. So that would be a cascade of four linear mappings. So you could even consider filtered back projection as a deep network of a cascade of linear operators to give a reconstructed image. So we know just by conventional methods that a simple linear mapping would do a good job, or a reasonable job at least. But if we start putting it into that machine learning paradigm, not only would we be able to learn with enough ex training examples the inverse mapping, but also notably it would simultaneously optimize for noise compensation, because we're trying to map noisy data to a high quality ground truth. And also furthermore, for better or for worse, this matrix could also begin to learn the manifold of PET images. In other words, it would begin to learn the types of object, the types of radio tracer distribution that we expect. And so we get prior information also built in. So if we have a linear mapping like this in the context of AI, or this would be known as a fully connected layer or a dense layer of an artificial neural network. Now, the big problem is, as you can see, I've just got a simple 2D example here. We would need maybe 100 million parameters to populate that matrix for a 2D reconstruction. Worse still, if we were to move to 3D reconstruction, this would need maybe a trillion parameters. So let's move on to see how we can simplify that. And a well-known example would be that of convolution. So here, for simplicity to get us started, I'm using a noisy image instead of a sinogram. We'll get back to the sinograms in a moment. And let's take a look at what just one simple convolution kernel can do. Now, of course, a convolution kernel um, is only going to need, uh, if I, for example, I have a 3x3 three three kernel, it's only going to use nine parameters because um, we just duplicate the values in this matrix F. It will only need nine parameters for a whole image to image mapping to take us from a noisy image, for example, um, to the ground truth reference. And so this is the well-known process of convolution. Here I've just got the, the noisy data, again here just as a noisy image in this uh, simplified example. I just list that in a column vector here. And then the convolution kernel just exists along rows that are duplicates um, and just shifted in this matrix F. And what it will do is neighborhood averaging with particular weights that are in that kernel to deliver an output. So that gives us a whole image to image mapping with only nine trainable parameters. So that's, that's, a, that's a step forward already. And again, let's just look at how powerful something as simple as convolution can be. Here I'm going to show how we can denoise with just one simple convolution kernel. Here I'll do a 5x5 five five kernel. So this is a noisy image, very low noise. And this is the ground truth reference. So this would be just one training set pair. And if we train up that uh, matrix F, we've just um, now a 5x5 five five kernel, 25 parameters. You can see that we've learned a neighborhood averaging kernel that will successfully denoise this to try and match the high quality ground truth. Of course, if we had noisier data, such as the one I just showed in the previous slide, the kernel that is learned for that is now this distributed kernel, which does the necessary increased level of neighborhood averaging in order to deliver this denoised image. And again, remember, this is just a simple linear mapping, which is why these are still not dramatically improved, but we can see they've done a good job at denoising based on training this to map the underlying ground truth. Um, and we could also go further. We could do um, such as um, deblurring or resolution recovery, because if we had a blurred image here that we're trying to map to a ground truth, then we could learn a kernel for that. And that'd be a five by five kernel here that already now has negatives in it. And so it begins to correctly do the kind of differential operator that we'd need to try and invert this blurring process to match the ground truth. So look at this, just one simple 5x5 five five kernel, 25 parameters. Already we can do some quite useful um, image processing, such as denoising, recovering resolution, at the cost of hardly any parameters 
compared to a fully connected layer with perhaps uh, you know, millions upon millions of parameters. So as we know, we can build up complexity further with convolutions. So if you'll forgive me for changing the phantom again here, this is just another example of a, of a brain phantom. And now I'm going to build in the nonlinearity. So here, I'm going to step it up further, going from a 5x5 five five to now a 7x7 seven seven kernel. And here, I'm actually showing you a pre-chosen, manually engineered 7x7 seven seven convolution kernel, which I can convolve with this. And we can see the convolved output here. And the reason for doing this is to say that if I've got that convolved output, I could then threshold or set to zero any negative values in this. And what we get is a feature map, which would show us the edges that are present in that image. Now that is uh, represented typically by saying, take the con convolved output from convolution with the seven by seven kernel, um, add or subtract some bias, then apply what we call an activation Typically, that's the ReLU rectified linear unit, which just sets the negatives to zero. So we can see how we can get a, a very useful nonlinear mapping um, that would give us what we call a feature map associated with a particular kernel. And so here I'm just demonstrating again the power of the methods that we're about to, to use for PET imaging. So if we change that kernel, we could pick out vertical edges and get a different feature map. Or indeed, we could use this distributed kernel about the size of, for example, this uh, tumor region here. And if we do the convolution, if we do a, a background um, shift, this bias, and then if we do an activation, a setting to zero of the negatives, we can see that this has picked out and identified that tumor in the, re in, in, in the, um, in the image here. So these are examples of feature maps from just three different convolution kernels applied to an image here, a simulated PET image. And uh, I'll be representing this talk, um, these feature map outputs by convolutions, um, by using this kind of bar format here, where I'm saying I've done a convolution with a 7x7 seven seven kernel, and I've got three of them that I've applied here. Because, of course, what we'll be doing is learning these kernels from training data pairs, such as I touched on earlier. And then the activation uh, will be shown, for example, by a bar like this, where I'm doing a rectified linear unit to set negatives um, to zero. So the point is, this is obviously, you should recognize this, this is none other than the building block of a convolutional neural network where what we can do is cascade these kinds of convolutions. So here we've got feature maps associated with that image, but then what we can do as we add on more and more layers is get feature maps of feature maps, feature maps of feature maps of feature maps, and end up with a hierarchical uh, feature map representation if you like, a kind of encoding of all the information that's present in this. And then when we've got that encoded information, we can then decode it however we choose according to the training that we're doing. So this is at the heart of deep learning, um, for example, as we use in PET reconstruction. So let's get back now to um, the reconstruction case in PET after I've hopefully motivated the use of convolutional methods. Here is a, a, an example for direct deep learned reconstruction for positron emission tomography. This is just a representation of the method of Hagstrom et al. published in Medical Image Analysis a couple of years back now, where what they start off with is what's called a convolutional encoder. So here are those kind of bars that represent those convolutional filter banks that I've just shown in the previous slides. And at the input now, instead of an image, we can now begin to put in um, a measured sinogram. So here I'm showing one that's maybe contains 77,000 uh, sinogram bins. So that's a 77,000 dimensional vector. So you've got to remember with this kind of deep learn mappings, all we're doing is a high dimensional vector being mapped to another high dimensional vector. And what you'll see here is that we're not only doing those uh, finding of the feature maps where we'll be learning the values of the kernels. And here I've got 32 kernels of size seven by seven in these early layers, then what, what we're gonna do as we progress into this deep architecture is we're gonna reduce uh, the spatial sampling. And that can be done by a method known as striding in convolution where we skip uh, pixels um, in, in the sliding of the kernel over the image. And that reduces the spatial sampling. And at the same time, we're gonna be increasing the number of those feature maps. So as we go from left to right here, what we're doing is re-encoding all the information in that sinogram into increasing numbers of feature maps until, as we get to this point here, 
we end up with what we'd call um, an encoded latent space where we've converted all that sinograms information no longer into spatially distributed information but into information in some kind of feature space. So there are many ways of looking at this. You could view this as a way of trying to model some kind of um, shift variant mapping because you may realize that convolution is a, is a shift invariant mapping, but by doing the spatial downsampling, we can actually begin to learn uh, the spatially variant mappings that we would need, for example, in reconstruction in PET. And so, in summary, then, we've just converted information here into an encoded latent space, a different, very high feature dimension representation of that information. And so here I've just got these, uh, the batch normalization and the ReLU occurring after each one of these convolutional layers. Once we've got that encoded information, we are then in control. We can decide how to map that. Um, are we going to use it for some kind of classification task, some kind of um, diagnostic task? But of course, in reconstruction, once we've got this latent space representation of the data, what we do is we decode or we generate from that a reconstructed image. This is just a re-expression of that information in the form of an image. So here it's a 16,000 dimensional vector, a 128 by 128 image, and this is known as a convolutional decoder. Um, and so we've got the upsampling as well as the learning of the convolutional kernels that can re-express um, that latent space information. So with the method of Hagstrom, um, this is quite. A, this was literally pure uh, deep learning, and so no use of physics, no use of the Poisson distribution. So they needed to use two hundred thousand training data set pairs to learn about sixty million uh, parameters within this huge network. And they showed noise reductions, but possibly more usefully, they showed a one hundred times speed up compared to ordered subsets conventional reconstruction. Okay, we've got to press on to the, the more advanced methods now. So I've quickly shown you a core methodology for direct methods for PET reconstruction. And as I've touched on already, it's ignoring our imaging physics. It's ignoring the Poisson distribution. It's going to be a huge network and often only delivers a 2D reconstruction. So not very practical. Um, and it needs so much training data. It's slow to train. And even then, there's a question of generalization. What if our distribution is outside the domain of our training data? You know, that could be a concern. So that opens the way for the core of what the methods are that I'll be uh, finishing with today, which is the physics-informed AI, where what we do is take the, the benefits of, of AI, the mapping to a ground truth or high-quality reference, but, um, but now also including our knowledge of the imaging physics in that system matrix A that we saw earlier, using the Poisson noise model, and now by needing fewer parameters, we can make this practical for 3D and um, have a reduced need for training examples. And so what I'll be talking you through are what are so-called unrolled iterative methods, where we take uh, the iterative reconstructions, which I've touched upon and I'll unpack more now, we take those, we first of all unroll the iterative loop, and then we embed into that uh, convolutional neural networks. So I'm just going to represent the conventional reconstruction by Radon, by Compton and Poisson. And as we know, we'd have input sinogram and an output image. We have a nice iterative algorithm, a bit of code, and all is well. But we know the problems with noise fitting and regularization that I touched on earlier. Now, the method I've just gone through earlier would be pure AI, where we pretend we know nothing at all about the physics or the stats. We just put in the image, uh, sorry, put in the sinogram at the top here, run it through all those convolutional layers, and get a reconstructed output. And so what I'll be covering as we finish today will be physics-informed AI, which is basically taking the knowledge that we have here, combining it with the knowledge that we have, or rather the benefits that we have in terms of mapping data to ground truth references from AI. We're going to combine these two together into uh, data-based um, and statistics and physics-informed updates along with convolutional layers for learning the object manifold, for doing the regularization. So let's quickly go through the conventional method. This is just a few simple slides um, capturing um, what this iterative method does. What we have is some, obviously, first of all, we've got some measured data resulting from some, some unknown ground truth in the PET scanner field of view. So this is a sinogram data vector M. And what we do, and I said for 3D, there are maybe a thousand such sinograms. What we do in reconstruction is we initialize Xn 
with some uniform image. We put it through a model of the scanner. So this is going to be the matrix A operating on this image X to give a forward projected um, sinogram, uh, which is going to be AXN plus, for example, scatter effects such as which I'm denoting by plus a vector row here. Once we've got that forward projection, we take the ratio of the measured data to that forward projection. I'm showing that ratio here. And then we apply the adjoint of that system model A, so A transpose, a back projection operation, operating on that uh, ratio sinogram to give a back projection of correction factors, which are then used to multiply uh, the current estimate Xn. We divide by a sensitivity image to get an update of the image. So this is really um, just going into a bit more detail into those conventional methods before we now plug the AI into this. So if we iterate with this, this is at the core of most PET and even spec reconstruction, we just do this uh, iterative process. And as you can see, as we forward project, ratio, back project, and multiply, we get better and better reconstructions, which correspond more and more closely to the underlying ground truth. And you'll notice here, I've got noise-free measured data, which is why um, these images look pretty nice. So by iteration 32, we're closer and closer to what we expect. But in reality, we're not dealing with noise-free data, so we don't get reconstructions that look like this. This would get sharper as we continue iterating. In reality, we have noise due to limited scan time, due to limited injected dose. And as mentioned earlier, we actually want to go faster, reduce scan times to a matter of minutes, um, and we want to get things safer, um, reducing maybe down to as low as 1% of the injected activity which would give us a radioactive dose that's, that's much smaller compared to a standard PET scan. And if we do that, obviously we have count limited data and we're in that problem that I touched on earlier. Um, and here I've just put a little image of a, of, a, of a jumbo jet because what we're aspiring to is to get the radiation dose down to the dose level you'd get if you did an intercontinental uh, flight. So that would be a nice aspiration if we got down to 1% of the dose. Okay, so we've got this noise problem, just to reiterate that, using these conventional methods. And this is where we're now going to embed the machine learning into this iterative reconstruction procedure. So here is a, a demonstration of how we unroll that kind of iterative method. So I've got some initial image. I'm using these green boxes to denote that whole process. We've just seen the forward projection, the ratio, the back projection, and the multiplication. And we're going to get a, a sequence of iterative updates based on a measured sinogram, and then we get improved reconstructed images as we progress. But of course, if we've got noisy uh, data, then we're going to get a noisy image. And that's why conventionally, um, without using AI, the MAP methods, the maximum a posteriori methods based on uh, Bayesian priors, what they would do is just take that uh, sequence and they would now include an analytic, mathematically convenient denoising step of each iterative iterative update. So we'd have the, the EM update that we've just seen, and then we'd have a denoising update based on, for example, a quadratic prior, some kind of simplistic smoothing process. This is going to be the gradient of a quadratic prior, for example. We glue these two together in some update formula, which I'll give you in a moment, and we get an improved update, which would now uh, be resistant to noise. But of course, this denoising process is far from optimal. In fact, it's, it's certainly not optimal, and we don't know how strong to make it and it's all because it needs to be mathematically convenient for this MAP EM framework. So let's now see how we get the deep learning in there. Well, as you'll recall from the outset of this talk, what is the core ingredient to doing machine learning? We need high quality reference data for our training. So here, whether it's by simulation or whether it's by uh, high count acquisitions, we would do a full reconstruction of high quality data. So we're imagining this image at the bottom right here is a high quality reconstructed image. And then what we're going to do is use this reference data to inform that MAP-EM reconstruction that I just touched on in the previous slide. So now we've got a sequence of iterates of reconstructed images. And what we're doing as we go along here, we put them in to this module that represents a MAP-EM update. And what we see here is we take the image, we put it into a convolutional neural network, such as the type we've looked at extensively now in the previous slides. Um, and what we do is use that to denoise that image such that it, pr it produces a denoised image, which is now used as a constraint 
for that data-based update. So this turns out to be a very simple, constrained MAP-EM update. I'll give you the equations in a moment. Um, where the prior image is found by a deep learned denoising of the current iterates. This is effectively learning the manifold of pet images. In other words, the, the set of all possible pet images that we regard as feasible. So this is going to be far more constraining than some of those rather generic analytic uh, methods for regularization. And the way this works is that we run it all the way through this whole series of modules. This is one huge deep network to end up with a reconstructed image. And what we do is we train those denoises in every single module such that the output has a minimum mean square error loss when we compare it to the high quality output. So this is the key, the loss function, the objective function of this deep network. The output needs to match the high quality reference. And so what we end up doing is back propagating um, the gradients of this loss function all the way through that deep network to train up the values of that convolutional neural network in every module. Um, also, we're working on methods where we found it's very useful also to consider the loss at every single iteration as well to really stabilize and help the training process. But conventionally, it's so-called end-to-end training where we just look at the endpoint and get that to match the endpoint reference. So here's a, a rather big table, sorry about that, that just summarize where we are in the, in the field. Um, for, um, for unrolled iterative reconstruction with deep learning embedded. Um, I will show you a bit more in a moment of, of the method that I've worked on just last year with my former postdoc, Abafaz Moranian. That's this method along here in, in, the, in the second row here. And really, I just want to point out maybe a couple of key points here. First of all, that we're operating on 3D images here and that we only need a very limited number of uh, training set pairs because we're only training, for example, look at the one I'm pointing to in the, the, the central row here, we're only training maybe 77,000 parameters for that convolutional neural network. We're just trying to learn uh, the manifold uh, for the PET images. Um, maybe one other thing to point out is that that, that denoiser can be the same for all modules, which is what we did with this method here, which I'm calling forward backward splitting expectation maximization network. Um, it can be either the same for all modules or it can be a, a CNN that depends on each module. And so these are the kind of rival methods um, up to date. I mean, obviously these methods are being developed all the time and I'll show you some of our advances in a moment. So he, here is that FBSEM network I talked about. So we've got the familiar green box update. That's that iterative procedure, the MLEM update. And then we've got uh, in parallel with that, the deep denoisers that are convolutional neural networks um, that we've already seen earlier now. And then this fusion step, which I'll give you the equations for. So first of all, then we have a current image. And you'll also notice crucially here that I'm now including the MR information as an input channel to this convolutional uh, neural network here, which means this network will learn exactly how much or how little of the MR information to use in denoising that, that PET image, such that the output will match the high quality reference. Remember, we've got another reconstruction going on underneath with the high quality data. And so it can use the MR to match that. So this, first of all, is the uh, regularized update. That's what the image goes through that convolutional neural network to give a regularized update. Then we've got the green module. So our current um, estimate goes through the data-based update. So this is using our physics in the matrix A. It's using our knowledge of the statistics in the form of this EM update for the Poisson log likelihood. Um, and then what we do is this proximal operator where we're just seeking the output at each point here to be um, a method in fact, the MAP-EM method is seeking to maximize the Poisson log likelihood subject to this constraint. So this was that simple prior image that I mentioned earlier, where we're saying update the image, but make sure that when you fit the data, the Poisson statistics, the physics modeling, make sure it doesn't go too far. So this is the quadratic penalty. Don't go too far from that regularized update that we learned by deep learning. And then the fusion block is just gluing together. So in other words, the solution here is given by the combination of these two very simple updates. They can be regarded as gradient-based updates, gradient for the Poisson log likelihood, and then gradient for the learned prior that we've learned by machine learning. We fuse those two together to give this final um, update here. 
And all it does is just take the EM update from the database update and the regularized uh, result. Right, so just drawing to a close with some example results and quick future directions. These are the outputs uh, that we get with simulated data for that uh, forward backward spinning EM network. Um, here's the conventional OSEM reconstruction. I should clarify on the right hand side of this line here, we've got 100 times fewer counts. That would be analogous to doing the 1% dose level imaging compared to, in fact, well, it depends on how many counts. This is probably too high, 10 to the 10 counts to about 10 to the 8 counts on the right hand side. So seeing if we can denoise um, uh, at the level of 100 count, 100 fold count reduction. So there's the conventional method. Um, here's a conventional map EM. And on the right hand side here, I'm showing you the benefit of using deep learning. So um, the physics informed AI is that column on the right hand side there. I'll press on to the real data due to time. Um, so here now, the high quality reference is given by um, 30 minutes of data in this column here. And then I've got the conventional OSCM reconstruction with only two minutes of data shown here. And then I've got the physics informed um, unrolled network with the database update and with the CNN embedded at every single iteration, giving a result here that compares very favorably with the high quality reference when compared to the standard OSCM reconstruction. Now, out of fairness here, um, in these early uh, results from real FDG brain data from the simultaneous PEDMR scanner, I've also included a conventional UNET post-reconstruction denoiser. So it's very much like that convolutional encoding and decoding that we saw earlier, but just has skip connections um, to preserve resolution in the mapping from image to image. So this is just a post-reconstruction method. And it has to be said that this is actually doing extremely well in comparison to the physics-informed AI. And so that's why we're going to be looking at experiments where we're certain very certain that when we get to um, out of domain cases that the database um, update um, for FBSEM net should help us compared to that post reconstruction methodology. Okay, I'll just tuck, finish with uh, where we're going at the moment. Here's an example of how we're making this even more uh, advanced where we've got an unrolled pet reconstruction network at the top here. So that's very much like we've just what we've just seen before, except now we connect up all of the preceding uh, PET iterates to provide self-guidance at every step of the way to produce a high-quality PET image. And then what we've got on the bottom here is exactly the same kind of unrolled iterative reconstruction, but now applied to MR image reconstruction. So there we've got case-based data in the Fourier domain, and where our initial image is just an inverse Fourier transform. It runs through basically a least squares uh, methodology with regularization, of course, and what we're doing here is just providing PET information and MR information for every single iterative update such that the deep denoiser in every single module can benefit from all of the other um, iterates and, all of, and the other modality as well. And so we're finding some pretty promising results here because if you use conventional um, MR guided PET reconstruction, the kind of thing that can happen um, even with the FBSEM net that method that I mentioned earlier, what can happen is if there's a region in the MR that is not matched in the PET images, um, then you can see that conventional methods, I think you can just about see it here, that information can cross talk into the PET reconstruction, which of course is a big concern. Whereas if we use these synergistic reconstruction methods where we use all of the earlier iterates, then it can learn how to best use that MR information um, in a way that will not mislead the, the outcome. And so here we can see we've got a slight improvement in that region there compared to the ground truth target. And of course, we're always doing better than the conventional EM. Okay, must finish. So uh, in summary then, conventional reconstruction, the big problem is we're fitting to noisy data. We have no knowledge of a high quality reference and conventional regularization methods are too simplified and we don't know, you know how strong to make that penalty on the uh, negative Poisson log likelihood. Machine learning um, has the benefit of using that high quality training data. And we can embed um, the AI information into the con conventional um, iterative reconstruction methods uh, by doing the so-called physics informed AI that reduces the amount of training data we need, gets us into 3D, and hopefully will be more generalizable to unseen test data, which of course is very important for, for clinical imaging. Um, current and possible future directions, I've just touched upon synergistic deep learning reconstruction where we unroll MR reconstruction, unroll the PET reconstruction. Um, 
That's work in progress. We're also looking at multiplex PET imaging where we can use deep networks to disentangle um, multiple radio tracer signals that are inside the PET scanner at the same time. That's quite an exciting area. Um, also architectures, you know, we're all stuck with CNNs at the moment, but transformers are looking like far more powerful architectures that use a self-attention mechanism instead of a convolutional mechanism to deliver even more enhanced capabilities um, in those learning of the feature maps that we use in our encodings. Auto ML, the idea of using machine learning to design those architectures in an optimal way, um, as well as um, methods that can estimate the uncertainty in the reconstructed images. Um, and uh, you know, data is obviously a big concern, and that's why unsupervised pre-training of networks is a very good way forward, as well as self-supervised strategies. And I've already made some start, a start in that area. Um, obviously, it has to be said, clinical assessment is, is going to be crucial for all of these methods. So I just want to thank my co-authors on this deep learning review article that we published. It was last year, early access, but it's just come out at the start of this year. And so Guillaume Corder, Abafaz Moranian, Casper de Costa-Lewis, Sam Ellis, and Julia Schnabel. And uh, thank you very much for listening.